us this morning, just, just a, a really neat passage. And um, I'm just looking forward to uh, going through it with you. Uh, so we're just going to jump right in. It's Acts chapter 8. We're going to look at 25 verses within this passage, a good chunk. But what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through it sort of chunk by chunk by chunk. Okay, and so we're going to start off with the first eight verses. First eight verses of Acts chapter 8. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. And we'll, we'll just pause there for a second. And what this, this chunk of the passage does is it gives us the, the context, the context of what we're going to be looking at, but really the context of the early church. And that context, might I just say, is chaos. It is, it is stressful. This is not a, a nice time in the church. If, if you're a parent, it's, it's maybe a little bit like looking back to your, your, your child's earliest picture. Right? This is a picture of my son Spencer. Right here. Now, now, can I just say, I have many, many beautiful pictures of my son. But that isn't one of them. I mean, he is hooked up to wires and tubes and oxygen, and you can't tell here, but there's about four or five nurses, plus a doctor, plus myself. You see, Spencer, when he was born, he came out sort of a purpley, bluish color. He had a hole in his lung. Uh, they called it a collapsed lung. He, he, he couldn't breathe properly. And so they rushed him to the NICU. Well, I, I rushed him like, with them, and I, we went, and it was scary. It was traumatic. It was messy. It, it, was, there was, it was vulnerable. It was, it was chaotic. And that is what we see here in the early church. This is not rainbows and lollipops. This is a scary time for the church. You know, this word church that shows up in uh, the first verse, this is only the second time in the New Testament that this word is applied to a group of Christians. The first time it's applied is back in Acts chapter 5. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Right? You, you know the story, right? So Ananias had lied and, and Sapphira had lied and God had them killed. Right? He had them killed. And then at the, at the end of that story, in verse 11, it says, Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. And now here we have the second time that word church is being applied to the, the, the body of, of Christians. And what do we see in verses 1 and 2? We see that great persecution broke out against the uh, church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men were uh, buried Stephen. So there we have death again and mourn deeply for him. And the next verse doesn't get any better. Verse 3, but Saul began to destroy the church. Now just pause there for a second. Um, so Saul, he doesn't know it yet, but he's actually going to go through a name change, going to become a Christian, and he's actually going to write most of our New Testament. But that hasn't happened yet, okay? So right now, Saul is destroying the church. And that word destroy, it's, it's an interesting word. In the Greek, the Greek word this is actually the only place in the whole New Testament that it shows up. But if we go back to the Old Testament, which means we're going back to Hebrew as opposed to Greek, but we see the equivalent word in Psalm 80. In Psalm 80, and I'm just going to read you a little bit of the context. It says, Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest, listen, ravage it ravage it and insects from the fields feed on it that's verses uh, 12 and 13 and so here's this this image 
of this boar, this, this wild beast that is just going through this vineyard, just trampling it, just, just tearing it up. And this is the image that is now being transposed onto Saul as he is going through this church, this early church, and he's just ravaging it. He's just tearing it up. You know, and even when we think to that passage in Acts chapter 2, right? That, 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 that seminal event that, uh, of the early church, uh, it's, its moment of, of inception. The imagery that surrounds it, just listen to this. Acts 2, verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came. Verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. Verse 6, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. I mean, this, this is a time of chaos, of confusion, of stress. But it's also a time of excitement, of hope. As, as we move into verse 4, what it says is, those who had been scattered preach the word wherever they went. We see growth. And this isn't just growth coming from the leaders. In fact, we know that these are not the leaders. We know this because back in verse 1, it specifically said that everyone except the apostles was scattered, which is to say the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. It's the laity who went out, who were scattered. The, the irony being that the word apostle literally means the sent ones. You, you caught that? The sent ones stayed. <laughs> the laity, they're the ones who, who went out, who were scattered. And they're the ones who are preaching the word. And we see this, this growth happening. And then we see this character, Philip. You know, and, and, and Philip is, is, he is the first evangelist. I mean, later on in uh, Acts 21, it's going to refer back to Philip, referring to him as the evangelist. He's the first. He's the Neil Armstrong of evangelism. And it says here that he goes out and he, he, he preached the word. Preached the word. Now, now that literally translates from the, the Greek word evangelizo. Evangelizo. What, what word do we get from that? What, just shout it out. What word? Evangelism. Evangelism. And it literally means to announce glad tidings or, or to bring the, the good news. And this word, we're going to see it throughout the New Testament. But of all the times that we see it in the New Testament, half, half of the times that we see it, we see it coming from this author. It's coming from Luke, either in his gospel or here in Acts. All that to say that this is a really important uh, concept to Luke. This is essential for the message of the church. Do we, as a church, do we bring the good news? Do we announce the glad tidings? Is that what we do? Or, or do, we, do we preach condemnation and judgment? For Luke, it's, it's, it's all about the good news. It's all about that. And, and where, does, where does Luke start his ministry? In Samaria. And I, and I don't think that's insignificant. That he starts, the, the, the Neil Armstrong of evangelism starts his ministry in Samaria. Now I've talked about Samaria before, and I'm not going to go into the same level of depth today. But what you need to know about Samaria is that it is a hybrid nation. Okay, or it is a hybrid race of people. Okay? And, and the Jews don't like the Samaritans. Right? So the Jews are, are the pure race. Right? Like, like they, they are the Hebrews. Right? And if you are not a Jew, then you are a Gentile. Right? So you got, you got Jews, and you got Gentiles, and then you have in the middle, you got Samaritans. And Samaritans are, are this group of people that they were, they were Hebrew, part of the Hebrew nation, but then there was these other races that came in and they interbred and they became this, this, this hybrid, this hybrid 
nation. And why might this be important? Well, think back to Genesis chapter 12. Think back to that Abrahamic covenant. Do you remember the Abrahamic covenant? Now, if you don't, I mean, that's fine. Th these words might sound a little bit familiar. Genesis chapter 12, it starts off this promise that God is making with Abraham. I will make you into a great nation. I will make you into a great nation. So a nation, a nation is a group of people, small, I mean relatively speaking, a small group of people. That's where God is going to start. That's his promise, his covenant with Abraham. I'm going to start with you, going to make you a group of, uh, you know, with your nation. But then, this is how that covenant ends off. Ends off, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So did you catch that? God's going to start small, nation, and big. And big. All peoples. All peoples are going to be blessed through you. The really neat thing is that here we are, we're at that transition point right here. This is the transition point. This is the point where God is going from small, I'm working my mission through this Hebrew people, and I'm going to go big. And this is where, and so where does it start? It starts in Samaria. The group of people who are not quite Jew, not quite Gentile. They're, they're hybrid. Right? And that is where God is transitioning his mission as it goes, it goes wide. God never intended for his salvation to stay isolated in the nation of Israel. And now it is spreading outward. And we're talking about miracles and this is the miracle. I, I mean, we see Philip performing miracles. He's healing people. That's good. That's good, right? But there's another miracle. And the miracle is that in the time of this chaos and this stress, this time of the early church, God is not just working in spite of the situation, of the early trauma. He is working through it. He's working through it, literally. Literally. As, as, as the lay people go out, as they're scattered, God is using this moment to take his mission from small to big. And it's going to go really big. In fact, that, that person, Saul, who's going to be later... Paul, he's going to be uh, a key figure as he's going to take that evangelism to the Gentiles. All right, let's, let's jump right back in. We're going to cover verses 9 to 13 now. And we're, and we're being introduced by, to a really interesting character here. His, na his name's Simon, so just watch for that. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is a, the divine power, known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. And what we see here is we see the role of divine gifts in salvation. We see the role of divine gifts in salvation. Simon, I mean, he, um, he, has, a, he has a pretty good gig here. He's this magician guy, this sorcerer, and he's, he's popular, right? A lot of people are attracted to him. They want to watch him. You know, any of you enjoy watching magic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been watching this, uh, this uh, series recently on, on Netflix. Uh, what's it? Uh, Justin, Justin, what's the guy's name? I think I wrote it down. Wilman? Anyways, it's not important. He, he, does, he does magic, you know, and it's, 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 it's pretty cool. Like, 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 like magic, when you think about it, it appears miraculous. It does. It really does. Like, like, like it appears like, like the laws of physics are being contradicted here. It appears miraculous. It's not. <laughs> it's not. Like, it's trickery. We, we know that. But that's how it 
how it appears. You know, and, and I watch an episode, and I, I'm thinking, well, this is pretty cool. I want to watch another episode. Right? I, like, I'm attracted to this, this guy who's performing this magic, right? And the people here, they're attracted to Simon. And they want to see more. He's the, he's the great power. The divine power. He's like a god. And then Philip comes along. And Philip demonstrates the miraculous power of God. And we have this beautiful contrast. Luke contrasts these two characters, Simon and Philip. And so catch the contrast. We have Simon who is performing and he is using what type of power would we call that? Really, it's, it's de demonic power, sorcery, right? Demonic power. He's using demonic power. He is boasting. It says he's, he's boasting. He's boasting about himself. He's attracting attention to himself. And the people are what? Amazed, right? They're amazed. But then when we go over to Philip, what type of power is Philip harnessing? Divine power. Not demonic, divine power. And he is drawing attention not to himself. He's drawing attention upward to God. To God. And instead of just the people being amazed, we see the people are converted. They're converted. And this is the key difference. This is the key point of God's miracles. It is the purpose to draw people to God. Not to us, not to the person performing, but to God. And I, I remember one time, I was, uh, I was a teenager, and um, I'd gone to bed. I was in bed, I was awake, but my eyes were closed, and I was, you know, about to nod off, and, and I was praying. I was talking to God. And as I was talking to God, I was, I was saying something along the lines of, you know, God, you know, how do I how do I know that you exist? Like like how do I like really know with certainty that you are really real? How do I know that? You know what, God? I, I I'm just thinking here. I think it would be really like if you could help me out here. What I would like, God, is I would like a miracle, like a real miracle. I didn't need a miracle, but like I didn't need any healing. I was fine. But like. I, I just thought that would be really neat. Like if I could have like a, like a real, like something is levitating or appears that wasn't there, like, like, a, like a real miracle. And I was praying to God. I was like, God, can you just do that? Could you give me a miracle? Like you did it so many times in the Bible. Why can't I just, I just like, if I could just have a miracle, then I would know. I would know. And my faith would be so much stronger, God. Could you do that? And, and as I'm praying this prayer, I tell you, I, I heard in my head, I literally heard a voice in my head. It wasn't a feeling. It wasn't a, um, like there's a, a warmth. It wasn't uh, the pizza that I had eaten. It was literal words. And the words were Matthew 14, 31. Now in the context of my prayer, I didn't really see the relevancy of this because I wasn't asking for a Bible lesson. I was asking for a miracle. And so I'm kind of like, well, God, I'm just, you know, I don't know. And then Matthew 14, 31. And, and I'm thinking, well, okay, God, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll get up. I'll, I'll go. Over. I mean, I was comfy in my bed. But I'll, no, no, like, I'll, I'll do this. I'll go and I'll read this passage of Scripture. And I'm about to get up. And then I say to the guy, stop. And I say, well, God, you know, here, here's the thing. Um, I'm just thinking, like, if I go and I read this passage of Scripture, like, how do I really know this is you? Maybe it's, maybe it's my own voice in my head, or maybe it's just, I don't know, like, you know? Like, I don't know. And how do I really know that this is really you? And I'm just thinking, like, if, God, if I go and I read this passage, and it's one of those verses that don't, doesn't really have any meaning. I, no, I mean, I, I know the whole Bible has meaning. Like, I know that. But, you know, like, one of those passages is, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so. God, this is going to kind of challenge my faith even more. And I, I, I just don't know. Matthew 14, 31. Okay, okay, God, I'm, I'm going, I'm going. And, I, and I, I climb down from my bunk bed and I, I grab my, my Bible and I, I, 
I open it up to, to Matthew chapter 14, and at a, at a first gla glance, I, I was actually discouraged. I, I, I didn't even see 31 verses there, and then I realized, I flip over the page, the next page at the top, and as I looked down and I read, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? You, of little faith, why did you doubt? Wow. I, what do I say? I mean, from that point forward, I, I would never need another miracle. Like that was, God spoke to me. He spoke to me. And, and, and the point of that is that it draws you to him. The point of a miracle is it draws you to God. All right, we're, we're jumping back in. Verses 14 to 17. And I, I'm just going to warn you now. This passage here, <laughs> short passage, hard passage. All right, just telling you now. Verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So this passage, this uh, little section here is... Um, it's difficult for a lot of Christians. In fact, for a lot of theologians. Um, it, it begs this question, like, if these people had come into faith, then how is it that they had not yet received the Holy Spirit? I, I, I thought when you ask Jesus into your heart, he comes in, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they're one and the same. Like, what's happening here? as I was looking into this passage, I found some interesting theories. Um, some theologians hypothesize that the faith of the people were defective. The faith of these people, so it says that they came to faith, they didn't. They, they, it was bad faith. <laughs> they, they just didn't, it didn't work. Right? It's a theory. That's, a, that, that's the theory. I have two problems with this theory. Uh, first of all, what we see here in the previous few verses is completely consistent with what Jesus had commanded. Jesus said in his great commission, Matthew 8, uh, 28, 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is a, these are Jesus' words, and that's exactly what happened. That is exa exactly what we see. Now secondly, let's just say, their faith was defective. Let's just say, you know, Philip did it wrong. Bad evangelist, right? And the apostles, they come along, right? They come along to correct Philip. Then what do we see in it here in the, in the passage? What do we see uh, the apostles, uh, was it uh, Peter and John, kind of taking Philip aside and saying, look, buddy, you messed up. <laughs> like, you did it wrong. It's not how you say the sinner's prayer. Wouldn't we see that? We don't see that. It's not there. So this theory, I, I have a hard time with this theory. Uh, here's the second theory. Um, some hypothesize that God, now listen to this, held back his spirit. He held back his spirit until the apostles arrived. Think about that for a second. So I, I think we understand that most of us believe that when you come into faith, you ask Jesus into your heart. And the moment you ask Jesus into your heart, he comes in. Right? That's what we believe. And here, the, this theory is saying that these people, under Philip, they said the sinner's prayer, they, they, they bowed down, and they, they asked Jesus into their heart, and God in heaven looked down and said, oh, this isn't that wonderful. I should, uh, well, mm, I'll be there in a few days. Right? That's the theory. <laughs> Is that what God does? So here, uh, 
you, you may pick it up in my voice. I, I have a hard time with this theory as well for a couple of reasons. First, we do not see this pattern anywhere else in the New Testament. It doesn't exist. It's just not there. We don't see it. And the second problem is that what was the whole point of Jesus dying on the cross? Right? Like, what happened when Jesus died on the cross? At the point in time when he died, the curtain in the temple was torn. It was torn from top to bottom. That curtain, that barrier that divided the, the inner sanctum, that holy of holies, that place that, that only the priest once a year could go from the outer part of the temple, the part where the, the common people could gather, that, that dividing curtain was torn. It was torn to say that you have direct access. That you have direct access to God. That no longer would there be this curtain dividing. That no longer would you have to access God through a priest or through an apostle. The whole point was that you can come to God. And you can. And they can. And they did. And that's why I, I just don't, I have a hard time with this, this theory. No, no. For, when I read this, what Luke seems to be indicating is, first of all, that these people had come to faith. That they were believers. But that there is this, this second act or this subsequent act of salvation. And it's known here as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So first we come into faith. We accept Jesus into our heart and he comes in. The Holy Spirit comes into us. And he dwells with us. But after that, there is this, this, this act, this subsequent act, where we can yield ourselves to God. Where our relationship with him becomes more intimate. Where he, he empowers us in a new way for our growth and for witnessing. And this is not the only time we see this in Scripture. When we look back to that, that seminal event in Acts chapter 2, verse 4 says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, just pause for a second. All of them. Who is them? Who are these people? They're Jesus' followers. They're already believers. They are already believers. So, and all of these already believers were now filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And there was this, this outward phenomenon, the speaking of tongues. We understand that when you come to Christ's salvation, that's an inner thing. You don't see that like from the outside. But now there's something that is seen. It's on the outside. Acts chapter 10, 44 to 46. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Again, these are people who are already following. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they had seen them speaking in tongues and praising God. And once again, we have this, this outward thing that's happening. Then Acts chapter 19. Remember Saul, who's going to later become Paul? Well, this is Paul having a conversation with a group of believers. There he found some disciples. Pause. All right, did you pick up that word? Disciples. These are people who already believe in Jesus Christ. And asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no. We have not heard that the Holy, there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And then later on in verse 6, it says, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So in each of these uh, circumstances, we see people who are already in the faith. They're already believers. And yet... God then wants to do something more in their faith. Do something more in their life. And so there is this, this baptism, the subsequent act 
And most of those passages refer to the speaking of tongues or some other, you know, there's this, this physical thing that can be seen by those outside of them. And I think this is really neat for us. I really, it says to me, we don't just come into faith and that's it. Like, yeah, hey, I'm a Christian. I guess we just sort of, you know, you know, kind of join our little weekly club and just sort of coast through life the rest of the way. We come to faith, yes, but there's more. <laughs> there is more. God wants that with you, that more intimate relationship with you. And he wants to empower you, not just for yourself, but for the purpose of witnessing. All right, we're, we're diving back in. We're going to cover the last uh, chunk here, verses 18 to 25. When Simon, so here we see Simon coming back to the, uh, to the story. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Simon really messes up here. I mean, he really messes it up. I, he, he treats Christianity, or tries to treat Christianity, much like he would have treated things in the occult practices from which he came. He's kind of sliding back into those, those old ideas where he probably would have, you know, exchanged or purchased spells or incantations back when he was a sorcerer or a magician. But in Christianity, this is outrageous. It's outrageous. In fact, if you have a J.B. Phillips Bible... Peter's response to Simon is translated to hell with you and your money. That, like I know it, it sounds like profanity, but in the context, it's actually accurate. Right? Like, like, like Simon, Simon's request was so repugnant that there are some theologians that believe that Simon wasn't saved. Uh, he couldn't have been. How, how would someone saved make this type of request? So we'll just say, well, no, he just wasn't saved. I, I, I don't know. I, I have a hard time with that because when we look back to verse 13, what do we see here? It says, Simon himself believed, pause, that is the only requirement for salvation, right? He believed, right? When the, the man on the cross said to Jesus, please remember me, and Jesus said to him, you know, today you will be with me in paradise, Okay, so Simon believed, goes on, and was baptized. So not only did he believe inside, but he also made an outward profession of his inward belief. And he followed Philip everywhere. So, so that, Simon to was say, heading in one direction in his life, and at some point, he had this turning point where he decided to now follow Philip, to go a different way. This belief, it, it impacted his actions. And Finish, finally, it says, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. He was astonished. There was this inner sense of awe that this faith was genuine. And, and so I, I don't really buy this idea that, that he wasn't a Christian. But nonetheless, I mean, his request was outrageous. I, I mean, it was, well, wicked, according to Peter. And why? Why? Well, Simon wants to buy God's miraculous power. Hmm. Think about that. So, if God's grace can be purchased, then Jesus' death on the cross is meaningless. 
If God's grace can be purchased, then Jesus' death on the cross is meaningless. You know, there are not a lot of theological points as important as this one. God's grace is offered freely. Okay? You can't buy it. You can't work for it. You can't earn it or trade for it. It is a gift. It is given freely. The prodigal son wanted to work his way back into the, the, his father's household, back into the family. He couldn't do it. It's impossible. You can't do it. It doesn't work that way. His grace is offered to you freely. You either take it, you either accept it as it is, or you don't take it at all. And the other problem we see here, as I had mentioned previously, is that God's miraculous power is not for the purpose of drawing people's attention to the individual. It's not about making Simon look good. It's about drawing people to him. And here we see Simon is, he's a believer, I think he is, but in his ignorance, he's a young believer or early believer, he's still working out his faith. I remember when I was a youth, a little bit older than the last story I, I told, and I, I was attending a youth group at uh, Queensway Cathedral in Toronto. And I remember this one particular uh, youth service that I was at. And at the end of the service, there was an altar call. And so there was a, a few youth up at the front. And, and, and they were there and they were praying. And, and I went up to pray for one of them. Um, for, there was a young girl and then I started to pray for her. In the context of this youth group, that, that wasn't abnormal. And I started to pray for her. And as I, as I was praying for her, I, I started to get louder. And louder and, and louder. And you, see, you see, I had come from another Pentecostal church where, where charisma was sort of seen as almost like a, like a gateway into God's favor. And so I was, I was getting in the spirit here. And, and I'm praying for her. And the youth pastor comes and he taps me on the shoulder and asks me to stop. And I was humbled immediately. And immediately I, I knew what I did wrong. I was making it about me. Look at me. Look how great, how spiritual I... God didn't need my pumped up volume. Certainly that young girl didn't. She was, she was being intimidated. She was a, a young Christian and I wasn't even thinking. And, I was being a Simon. I was making it all about me. And after his condemnation, Peter calls Simon to, in verse 22, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. And it seems, it seems that Simon listened to this because two verses later we see Simon answered, you know, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And this is the wonderful news for us. This is the wonderful news because it says to us that there is this, this process of us working out our faith. And as we go through life, as we work out our faith, there are going to be times where we are going to mess up. And when we do, God still wants to work with us. He still wants to mold us. He still wants to work through you to make you into what He knows you can be. He's still there to, to bring you closer, to baptize you in His Holy Spirit, to, to endow you, endow you with, with new powers for yourself, but, but also for witnessing to others. And if we are willing, if we are willing to humble ourselves, He is willing to continue to make us, to mold us, 
to work through us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, your blessings truly are endless. In this passage, we see a time of, of stress, of chaos. We see a time where a persecution, a time where of, of, of just intense um, trauma, Lord. And yet we see you in and through these people in that moment. And we see an early church and we see early Christians and we see people who are making mistakes and yet you are there for them. You're there to empower them. You're there to forgive them. You're there to work for, with them. And God, I just praise you, knowing that just as you did that in Acts chapter 8, you're more than willing and excited to do that in each of us here today. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would take a second really to reflect. Where are we in our faith? Where are we in our faith, Lord? And where, where would you have us be? We know that you are more than happy to equip us. God, I pray that you'd help each one of us to, to really reflect on that. And that by your spirit, you would draw us closer and closer to you. And at times where we kind of step out and, and fall back, fall back into those old ways of doing things. Lord, I pray that you would cover us by your grace. And Lord, I thank you for the truth of your word and for this passage and what you've said to us this morning. And Lord, as I pray over us now, I also would like to pray over this opportunity that we have to also worship you in our givings. And uh, as the, the baskets are about to go around, Lord, I just pray over this offering that uh, you would use it to further your work in this church. Pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And so the people with the, uh, the baskets are going to uh, pass those around and uh, give you an opportunity to, to worship in your, your giving as well. Um, yeah, this is the time of the service where we, we, we generally have, you know, questions and answers and your chance to kind of, um, you know, either ask me a, a question about the passage or something I said or also make a comment that, that relates. Um, I don't know, I was just wondering if, if there's anyone who would, you know, be willing to share kind of what's your takeaway from this passage? You know, I didn't really do kind of a, a set of takeaways at the end. I oftentimes do that at the end of the service. And uh, in this passage, I kind of did it kind of throughout the, the passage. Well, what's your takeaway? As you hear, you know, we talked about salvation. We talk about um, forgiveness, about, um, you know, God's work in these early believers, the baptism. Is there anyone here who would be kind of bold enough to, to say, yeah, there's something that, that I'm taking away today. Are we? Yes, over here, there's Scott. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, well, I, I, I read um, every day, I, I, you know, the, the, pa the, the terminology seek my face every day is on my mind. Um, when I start my day um, and I find with faith mm -hmm. I try as hard as I can some days it's easier and other days it's mm -hmm. harder and and to, to seek that face and to see it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is not that easy yeah and so when it's not what do you do yeah you know you just I, I you know I, I just I keep trying I keep asking I keep looking mm -hmm. I keep mm -hmm trying to feel like you, you know but sometimes it it, it it comes to be this holy spirit yeah and sometimes not 
but it's the trying that I think is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think you said it beautifully. I think you really did. Yeah, that 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 trying. That that you know, I I, I use that phrase that working out of our faith. But um, and that sometimes it is. So sometimes it's easy. Like like there are, there's days where it just seems easy to be a Christian and to to worship God. But but no, there's also a lot of days. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for those of you who couldn't hear, she's just saying, you know, we live by what we see, right? And so it's really hard when when you can't see. And and yeah, that's that's a challenge with faith, right? That that's uh, that was my my adolescent uh, prayer to God on my bed, <laughs> you know, like God, I, how do I see you? How do I know that I know that I know that you're there, right? And and yeah, yeah. Sometimes God will speak in a variety of ways, and yeah, yeah. And of course, that wasn't the first time I'd made that prayer when you know that day. Um, and that day, God really chose to speak to me in a real way through His His Word, you know. But I wanted the easy way out. I, I wanted a miracle. I want to see something float, or you know. But but then that's not faith, right? Of course, in my my naivety, my youngness, that was my prayer, right? Yeah, it's right here. Um, you had talked about how uh, it's not about us, like when it comes to God's power and uh, the miracles and stuff that he chooses to do. Mm -hmm. And I know like for me, last year, just talking about like seeing miracles and asking for miracles and stuff, like I, I don't doubt that God... Uh, can, can do miracles and that he can heal and he can oh, do the things that, yeah. uh, that the Bible says that he can do. But sometimes when I pray, I'm not like expecting anything to happen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just you're praying. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. Um, you're praying just because you feel like it's something you're supposed to do, you know? And like last year, my grandpa was really sick. He was dying and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Uh, mm -hmm. His heart was failing and his mm -hmm. liver was failing and they had to resuscitate him like four times. And mm -hmm. They gave up on him, and like we just, I just prayed. I was like, "Hey, God, can you just like not let my grandpa die?" I'd super appreciate like if that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And um, his kidneys started working again, yeah. and is he like he got better? He's fine now, right? Yeah. So like yeah. then the the doctors never found out what was wrong with him. You know, like yeah. later on they found out that he had something up with his heart. And mm -hmm. They found out that they were like overdosing him with something. <laughs> And uh, so, like, I mean, that was totally God, right? And, like, the doctors were actually killing him, whatever it was that they were doing. So, I mean, wow. uh, wow. I, like, I've seen miracles, right? Yep. So, yeah, uh, it wasn't because of my faith. It wasn't because of uh, mm -hmm. anything that we were doing or the doctors were doing. Yeah. Like, God came through even though there was, like, basically no faith, right? Just, like, a prayer of, like, exasperation. <laughs> like, yeah. can you please just do something, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, and, and to your point about faith, and this kind of links with the previous comment, was, um, you know, the Bible talks about having faith the, the size of a mustard seed. And, of course, a mustard seed is a very, very small thing. And, and the whole point is not just to, you know, have big faith or little faith. It's, it's do you use the faith that you have, right? It's that trying. It's that trying, right? And, and it's that working out of your, your faith that, that over time your faith will grow. Um, but I, I don't. I mean, I think in this passage we see some very early Christians and their faith. I mean, Simon. I mean, he he messes up there, right? But God works with the faith that He has at that time, right? Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Um. You talked about how like. When you were praying for that girl, you were like doing it all like about you, right? Mm -hmm. But then, how do you balance between like like talking, going out, and like talking about God, and like not doing it in a way that like focuses focuses on you, like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, right? And it really, and actually, I, I think in your question really is is essentially the answer, which you're really. Um, talking about how we need to reflect on our motives. We really need to reflect on our motives, 
before we go out to pray for someone or before we go out to to witness to someone or you know before we try to correct someone that we really got to wrestle with that and maybe before we go we we take that that moment just to say you know god why am i doing this and and you know it doesn't mean that we don't do it but that we have that pause so thank you for for bringing that up ashley yeah anyone else is that Great. Thank you for, for participating. Um, I'm going to pass it off to John and uh, he'll lead us in some worship. Mm -hmm. Why don't you stand?
Lord, have you always with us. continue to speak to our hearts and we we ask father for that that power the holy spirit gives us to be witnesses to the world around us father I thank you so much for giving scott this message it was timely it was well delivered it was um honest and humble thank you for that we needed that today and father there's so many of us that sometimes our faith feels like we're coasting or or we just feel like we're just getting by father i pray that you help us to be the believers that win by a touchdown that we would uh we would not only be joyful in the salvation you give us but we will be powerful and dangerous for your kingdom we ask this in jesus name amen um i just want to thank scotty for delivering that message from our sermon writing team we really we, we talked a lot about this because sometimes uh, messages, particularly from the book of Acts, they set off denominational stuff, right? And, 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 and I've grown up in the church and I've seen a lot of debates on either side and, uh, and things. And uh, I've always felt that if it's in God's word, I want it. And, and that really is, you know, as a church um, where we've got people from all kinds of backgrounds in that. Um, that's that's really where our commitment is to be a new testamental church we had multiple denominations plant us we are affiliated denominations plant place uh, and have a very viable um, function in the church first of all if a leadership in a church lose their marbles then a denomination is really great to help out at times like that they also provide legal documentation insurance all those kind of things they really serve a good function so i believe in denominations what i don't like is when denominations fight instead of opening their bibles they kind of take hard rigid lines and all kinds of different things hey listen it's god you can't ever have enough of him right and so as scotty has given this fantastic message and i'm going to put it up i'll put it up on our website tomorrow our homework this week is to go look through those passages read them and say god what do you want to do in my life because coasting um it wears thin after a while you know, maybe there's something you want to do in my life that maybe the miracle is going to be me opening up my heart to God and allowing him to do something special in it. And next week I talk is really, you know, this is how the Holy Spirit works. Scotty, at the end of his message, quoted the passage I'm preaching on next week. Talked about a mustard seed, right? And, and that's, you can look at that and say irony or coincidence or whatever, or when John picks a song that just... You know, we plan stuff and we give scriptures out, but sometimes he picks a, a song. It's just like, dude, you read my mail. You know, I last night didn't know I was going to say this today, and you've picked a song that just fits it. it it's just such a, an important part of the church. And so as God continues to work and do that, open up your hearts and say, if it's in the scriptures, God, what do you want me to do? Does that make sense? All right. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Next week, we learn the next message on when pigs fly. All right? And uh, the winner of the... Trish, you won the card. <laughs> hey, sweet. Good for you. That's great. I will give that to you after the service. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being with us.